Hi everyone, thanks for joining me on another John and Jane taxable account uh, update for the month, in this case for the month of August. I've been working on um, getting the format for all the articles set and definitely feel like I'm at a point where I can get the August updates uh, published here shortly and then get the September ones done so that we can basically be back to a point where everything's current. Um, but also that I can get into some other um, subjects that are a little bit more fun, a uh, little bit more um, actionable and educational, especially for younger folks, um, because I also want to um, get into some things that I'm pretty passionate about as far as credit education and budgeting and things like that. So just things that I think um, can really, really help out the average person. So without further ado, let's jump in. Um, I'm not a financial advisor. I don't claim to be one. And this is basically all my own personal views and does not reflect um, the views or opinions of my employer. And I do hold some similar positions with John and Jane as far as their their holdings go. And this is a real portfolio. Um, so this is not play money. This is not a, a fake portfolio that... Um, uh, I take screenshots of this is an actual portfolio with with shares being traded and real money so uh, I am going to make an article in the future as I've mentioned about why I do this and kind of a background on John and Jane that goes a little bit more in depth um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this but basically um, they were being taken advantage of and I really don't like that um, does not sit well with me and so when we figured this out it was a great opportunity um, for them to switch and basically take control of their money themselves um, so my goal here is to show people that um, you're able to do it and even if you don't want to put in a lot of effort um, that is something that that is is very possible because of all the tools that exist nowadays and that is one reason why i love charles schwab and then again as far as john and jane's background we have two retirees um, and right now they basically have no debts um, they do have some investments outside what i what i help them with which are primarily you know low risk um, debts or not debts low risk um, investments, you know, typically CDs, bonds, things like that. Um, but also, they do take uh, draws off of these accounts um, in addition to the Social Security income that they receive. So we have about $2,200 of dividend and interest income in August of 2023 compared to $1,900 in uh, August of 2022. Uh, balance in the account for August about 542,000 as compared to about 512.5 thousand in August of 2022. We're looking at about an annualized cost basis yield of 5.68 percent and there's five companies in the taxable portfolio that paid increased dividends or a special dividend during the month of August and no companies decreased their payout in the month of August. So we have Arbor Realty at an increase of 2.4%, Clorox at an increase of 1.7%, Enterprise Product Partners at 2% increase, Energy Transfer at 0.8% increase, and General Mills at 9.3% increase. We recently trimmed the positions in Arbor Realty and General Mills. Arbor Realty is a little bit higher on the risk side of things, and so um, we were able to reduce our higher cost shares and m basically move the position back to just where it's extremely low cost shares. Uh, I would consider buying more, um, but I wanted to trim it back because um, the the rising rates and just the overall environment suggest to me that, that, that Arbor Realty's price is just, it's a little bit too high. And then as far as General Mills goes, um, we closed out um, a high cost position and got the portfolio back to where it's um, at its lowest cost shares. Um, again, would consider adding more in General Mills, um, but basically our um, lower cost shares are, are, you know, we'd have to see the, the stock price drop pretty substantially. Um, the thing about General Mills is that the yield that that um, 
stock is paying is not enough to justify the downside risk that's associated with with rising interest rates. So, you know, that stock's currently paying under a 4% yield. And frankly, with being able to take that money and put it in a CD at 5% um, or 5.5%, I just I don't see um, enough of a benefit to keep it in, in general mills. So at least to have it be a, a necessarily large position. Um, and then as far as Clorox goes, stock prices recently gotten hammered um, after their cybersecurity attack. Um, but also Clorox has struggled for years, which is why we had reduced the position down to five shares in the first place. Um, and I'll show you later on some of the cost basis um, details of, of Clorox because it used to actually be a pretty substantial position until we um, reduced the size of it. Uh, as far as um, EPD and ET goes, um, we've been seeing a, a great comeback um, in in the most, I, I would say even just the most recent few months, um, but especially since uh, 2020, um, we've been seeing the, the stock price continually, you know, climb back. Um, and frankly, everything looks strong to me. Um, I like both companies. I think that the EPD's definitely been more consistent over time, but energy transfer has has definitely um, earned investors trust back with with uh, after its large distribution um, cut. Um, they definitely have have made it clear that you know that that they're interested in getting it back to where it was because I believe actually it's paying. Um, even more than it was at the time that they slashed the dividend or slashed the distribution. So for Arbor Realty, uh, again, just wanted to show everyone our cost per share um, is extremely low. Um, this position was established quite a while ago, but also um, we took the opportunity to increase it um, and take on a little bit more risk um, during the initial phase of, of COVID. Um, so you can see that the stock price would basically have to be cut in half um, in order to, you know, get to where we would be back at a break even. So um, definitely interested in adding more um, uh, shares, but I I would like to see that stock price come down um, and, and be a good buying opportunity before we do that. Clorox, again, much lengthier history. Um, I apologize I didn't go back enough on my screenshot um, because this position was originally established prior to 2019. Um, but you can see here that we closed out the largest portion of, of shares um, here back in the middle of, well, middle and end of 2022, um, but um, had established a much lower cost position um, you know, heading into the middle of 2022, I guess you would say. Um, but on here, you know, back during COVID, um, their stock price was inflated and looking back on it, uh, definitely bought in um, at, at too high of a point. Um, because frankly, with, with Clorox, the the earnings have, have been in a very weak place. Um, and which is why the dividend just there, there's been no money to increase the dividend with and there just hasn't been anything that's you know allowed the stock to just really grow in terms of its its earnings so it would be one thing if it was a company like um, uh, I use Dover as the example where Dover is not offering any substantial dividend increases. In fact, if I recall correctly, I think they only do about 1% dividend increases per year, but their earnings per share have been growing rapidly. So even though it's a dividend king um, that has been paying dividends for, I think it's going on about, or increased dividends for going on about 60 years, um, I am okay with, with Dover because they are growing the company and and using um, the the lack of dividend increases to to in place of essentially financing right they're using that as the opportunity to grow the company so a company reinventing itself like dover um, if clorox was doing that 
I'd be interested, but the problem is, is that um, right now their lack of dividend increases seem to be more related to the fact that they just don't have anything that's allowing them to increase their their earnings, the, the spread, because the other thing that's affecting it is inflation, so the cost of production. And then enterprise product partners, um, you can see here that um, position was heavily established back in 2019, um, but also um, we took the opportunity during COVID to, to add additional shares as well. Um, definitely wish that we would have added more, but obviously, you know, hindsight's 2020 on this one. Um, but we have gotten to a point where um, the stock has, has definitely climbed out of the hole that it was in. Um, so, yeah, very, very happy with the performance in recent months. And I believe that we'll see that continue to improve. And then as far as energy transfer goes, um, we just recently made a purchase of additional shares in the month of October here. Um, and, you know, the goal here might be that we end up trimming back some of these high cost shares. But um, as far as I'm concerned, I still see room to run for the stock price. So I'm not, uh, uh, even if it gets back up to the $15, $16 a share level, I'm not necessarily interested in selling shares um, at this point unless a, a, another opportunity comes up that's more attractive. And then General Mills, um, again, these are the positions that they've been reduced back to in terms of the cost per share. Um, if the, the stock price was to get back down into the low $50 share range, I would definitely be, be a buyer again. And then as far as the August trades go, um, we, we saw the sale of some of the high cost shares of Rhythm Capital, and then also we purchased a small portion of WP carry shares. And unfortunately, we purchased these prior to the announcement of their spinoff and some pretty substantial business changes. Um, but that's also part of the reason why with stocks um, at these higher prices that we're, we're typically doing, you know, what I would say is tranches of, of about 10, maybe 20 ish shares at a time. And then as far as rhythm capital goes, we sold off the high cost shares. Um, and now this, the, the stock price has since dropped over a dollar a share. Um, not saying that we were able to predict or time that, but just it was at a point where it was attractive enough um, to sell off a, a very high cost portion um, because I don't foresee the stock price reaching back to that level where it was. I believe it was about fifteen and a half, sixteen dollars $16 a share um, that hasn't been seen in quite a few years. As far as the gain loss goes, um, you can see here that you know the the loss associated with Rhythm Capital um, was was pretty substantial, and that's for the exact reason that I mentioned that the the original purchase price of those shares was so high that I don't believe we'll be seeing that anytime soon. So that's part of the reason why we wanted to be able to get this one um, sold um, and and off. And then as far as the year-to-date gains, um, you can see that in the taxable account, there's been quite a bit of trading um, that's taken place, at least more than I typically would. Um, but this year, because of the increase in interest rates and the emphasis of uh, reducing risk and the size of positions in favor of CDs and cash on hand, um, that is part of the reason why we're sitting at about $35,000 of of trades that have been made um, in terms of the sales. But what's most important to note, and I'll reiterate this again later, is that you know our goal is to make it so that the gain or the loss is, is pretty minimal. And the whole point of that is that I don't need to be having a negative or, um, uh, well, I guess really just a negative impact on John and Jane's taxes unless it makes sense. And that's really part of the key with the taxable account is that the holdings that you have in there, um, you need to be able to justify having to pay taxes or, you know, the size of the, the, the loss that would be associated with it. 
um, because um, anything that you do in the taxable account is going to have a positive or negative impact. And the other thing is that the income that John and Jane um, earn on this account, when it comes to the total amount of CD and dividend income generated, remember that they are having to pay taxes on that. So even if they took no withdrawals from this account, and if the taxable account netted 20, I think it's about $21,500, you know, estimated for the year. Um, if they drew none of that money out, they would still have to count that on their taxes. So when they draw out that $1,700, part of that money is actually going towards paying for the benefits that they're receiving on this. So it's not like the taxable or not like the uh, traditional or the Roth IRAs where there's, there's no either no taxable event in the event, you know, in the case of the Roth IRA, but when it comes to the traditional IRA, there's no taxable event until you make a taxable event, which is when you draw money out of the account. So you could end up collecting all of that dividend income, never drawing it, um, at least not until the government forces you to. Um, so that's just, again, something to really be aware of. I see a lot of people treat taxable accounts, um, in ways where they, they, um, uh, trade a lot of stocks, they take a lot of gains off the table, and it's just, it's, it has a lot of negative consequences that I think that um, through learned experience that you just, you, you don't want to have that. And then as far as the year-over-year -year comparison, um, there's been a large increase in the um, uh, um, air products and chemicals and so that dividend income has has roughly doubled um, along with the size of the position. Um, Clorox dividends will cease to exist moving forward. Um, you can see that it was a pretty substantial amount of 2022's um, payout in the month of August, um, but it had since obviously been reduced quite a bit since then. And then the distributions from energy transfer have recovered rapidly. Um, that makes up um, a pretty substantial amount of the increase um, that we see going into August of, of 2023. And then also CD income. Um, we just recently added another CD that's the, the um, same size of $15,000. Um, so that income is going to start um, populating in the month of um, uh, October um, or November. So I'm looking forward to having that showing up as well, because basically what we're seeing is a reduction of dividend income across the board. And in this transition over to CDs, there's going to be basically a, a, a lag in the dividend income generated um, until those CDs start generating the income. Uh, uh, the interest income um, that's reported. So the full year over year comparison, um, you can see that the increase um, in income right now is estimated to be about 4.1% year over year. Um, and so that's a, a nice number to see in the month of July, it was sitting at 2.6%. So you can see that the month of August, the actual amount of dividend and interest income generated was substantially more than what we had estimated. Um, so that is now pushing up John and Jane's average monthly um, interest and dividend income to um, $1,865. So um, again, well more than what they are actually drawing from the account. And then the account balance, um, already covered this previously, um, but the balance in August of 2023 is not only up the $30,000, but when you factor in the $1,000 per month in 2022 of funds that were taken by John and Jane, and then the $1,700 per month in 2023, um, you can see that, that, that if we added those dollar amounts back in to get a true idea of what the balance difference is, um, we would say that it's probably in the ballpark of about 15,000 ish dollars, just shooting off the, or shooting from the hip. Um, so, you know, we're talking about that the account balance would be up nearly $45,000, um, as compared to the $30,000 where it is now. And then the, 
um, six year table uh, review. So just being able to look and see how dividend income and interest income has increased over time. Obviously there's been a slowdown and in the beginning there's a little bit more of a sporadic nature to it. But you can see that, you know, going from these wild swings to now, you know, having it where it's, it's very consistent um, in terms of, of the month of the year, what kind of um, interest or dividend income is being received. You know, certain months always produce more than others, um, but, but there's at least a consistency every three months, roughly, to how much was generated um, you know, prior to that in the pre in, in basically on a quarterly basis, you know, there's, there's definitely more of a consistency to it. One of the reasons why I like the CDs as well, um, is that I tend to find the ones that are paying on a, um, monthly basis instead of an at maturity type of situation. Um, so the fact that that income is collected now, it's not enough for me to say, I won't choose one that, that, um, doesn't pay until maturity, um, but if I have the option of choosing a 5.5% CD that pays monthly and a 5.5% CD that pays at maturity, and it's for the same term, I'm always going to choose the one that pays monthly. And then the cash balance, um, we're sitting at the highest point in 2023, and that is especially true when you factor in that there is now $30,000 invested into CDs, um, whereas this previously was $15,000. So we have um, sold off quite a few shares um, and added more, more cash into there. So really from a cash perspective, we're sitting at closer to about um, just under $60,000. The unrealized gains um, were coming off of a record high level in July of 2023, um, but as mentioned previously, we're extremely diligent with what is bought and sold due to the tax implications. Um, of course, we would love to sell off some of our high flyers um, and at least reduce uh, the size of those positions. So for example, Apple um, is currently a $31,000 um, market value position and it's sitting on gains that are um, uh, about 24000 um, so the only way for us to be able to reduce that um, is to offset it with losses if we don't want to have a large taxable implication that comes from, from the sale of it. And then the withdrawals comparison, again, 2022, it was $1,000 a month, but in 2023, we decided to move it up to $1,700 a month in terms of what was uh, sustainable. And then because we are looking at about $1,865 a month, um, that is something that, that if we continue to see it go up, we may choose to increase the amount withdrawn. But because of the lag in dividend income as we sell some of these shares and then convert them over into CDs or into bonds and treasuries, um, we don't want to put too much pressure um, in terms of what funds are actually available because the goal is to always draw funds from the cash flow rather than drawing funds by selling shares to to support um, the type of withdrawals that are being made. And then also, um, it should be noted that with the taxable account, no funds have been added into the taxable account in years. And if anything, um, back when John and Jane were working, is that we typically use the taxable account to fund the um, traditional IRA contributions. So just know that with the taxable account, um, there's no funds that have been added into the account um, randomly, you know, in order to inflate or make it look like it's performing better than it is. And then on the current gain loss table, uh, as I always say, it's my favorite table because I like to be able to show um, when things are going really well, where things maybe aren't going so well. Um, and also, you know, just making sure that when people uh, see other articles or see other creators on YouTube, you know, make outlandish claims about their portfolio always take it with a grain of salt. Um, you know, the people that tell you that they bought Apple stock at a dollar a share, 
um, they're lying to you. Okay, um, the people that have Apple stock at one dollar a share are going to be people that were either you know working for Apple at ground level um, back you know in pre two thousand, um, back when the company was struggling, and then. Um, uh, but the average investor is is not the kind of person that would know how to do that. So part of the reason why I love this table so much is that I have documented this for for going on six years, um, soon to be heading into the seventh year. And the idea is that, you know, we didn't buy Apple shares at some crazy valuation um, at, at the time that we bought them. Um, but by buying them and, you know, letting it grow over time, adding when things dip um, and just, you know, being a good steward of the funds that you have in your um, taxable or retirement account or whatever it is that you have um, is the best way to make sure that your account continues to perform well over time because again in this case these are two average people these are not um john jane are not people that had access to insider knowledge that allowed them to get ahead and that seems to be what bothers me the most nowadays is everyone is looking for a quick fix okay everyone wants the easy way out and frankly the easy way out is just to do it right Okay, so in this case, on the current gain loss, it is updated for figures as of October 5th. So when you're looking at the gain loss on here, the reason why that gain loss has dropped so much further is simply for the fact that, that the updates you saw in this article were from August 31st, whereas this is from October 5th. So we're talking about over a month later. And then as a conclusion, um, because I forgot this on the previous article, um, I thought it was interesting to point out that the 10 year treasury mark um, or rate broke through the 4.8% mark for the first time since the financial crisis in 2008. And then the 30 year mortgage rates are um, nearly 7.5% according to the Federal Reserve. And these are levels that have not been seen in two decades. So, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up is the conclusion point. Um, is because I, I see a lot of danger in the idea that um, not even I myself have been alive long enough or at least was not coherent enough at that age to really understand how today's environment matches up with something that hasn't been seen in 20 years. Um, and then, you know, you factor in, you know, excessive housing prices, inflation on vehicles, food, you name it. Um, it's, it, it just, it, it kind of makes me wonder if this is like a 1980s type moment again, right? Where you see interest rates heading to a point where, I mean, I live in the state of Washington and anything over 18% is usury. Um, so mortgage rates were, were at that point, you know, and CDs were paying 13%, um, back in, back in those days, at least that's what all my members tell me. Um, but it just makes me wonder, you know, if we've gone so long living on cheap credit, low prices, um, and just really bad monetary policy. And so it, it just makes me wonder exactly where things are going, which is why I'm, I'm definitely in, in the camp of move towards things that, that, that have less risk. Um, I'm doing CDs that tend to be between about three to six months. Um, so, you know, frankly, there's, there's very little risk. So if it creates a buying opportunity, great, we'll take advantage of the buying opportunity. But what I don't want to do is remain fully invested into the market and then find that, that, you know, we, we, we sat on a bunch of investments that, um, we could have done something about. And with the, you know, if interest rates were still at 2% for certificates, um, we'd be talking a very different story. But the reality is, that our risk-free rate being at about five to five and a half percent um, means that that 
we can we can get something that's actually producing a substantial yield, um, whereas that was not available a few months ago. So, you know, even just a few months ago. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for for taking the time to watch these videos. Um, please feel free to leave comments um, uh, on these. I try to check the videos and and answer any comments that that I see. Um, leave feedback, um, tell me if there's things I'm doing well, and, hey, and actually, you know, do me a favor and tell me if I talk too fast or if I need to elaborate on subjects a little bit more. I'm, I, it's really hard compared to the articles to find a balance in how to present this information to people without, you know, going in depth on every single, um, subject or at least word you know defining it when maybe that's not what people need but at the same time if there's someone new watching you know and i start using acronyms or things like that i want to make sure that that i'm not you know causing them to you know feel frustrated with the video because i keep using acronyms and they don't understand what i'm talking about so um yeah just let me know if there's anything that i can do do better in the articles. Again, I'm trying to improve them as much as I can. And it is definitely a work in progress because it's much more uncomfortable trying to have these conversations out loud rather than being able to think, produce it or put it into an article and then hit the publish button. So uh, I appreciate everyone um, for taking the time to watch and, and, um, also for those that that subscribe and like and uh hopefully we can get on to some more fun stuff um and other videos later on so thanks everyone bye